and we've got the capital between us, the finances, the thing that pays our way as we go along. And there's no way to separate those three elements of resources one from another. It's a matter of organizing those resources to focus in on the strategy of collective bargaining. And we've got it all. The first thing we've got to do is organize our people, starting with ourselves. Ourselves is the basic element of this organization. Each one of us is made up of an independent part of a gigantic industry of, of this country. And we are each part of the National Farmers Organization, free to think as we please, free to choose as we will, to form our own destiny within agriculture, within this organization. But we need to organize our thinking. How are we going to use the resources that we own and control? For whose benefit? The adversaries or ours? Once we put ourselves in order and get our priorities in order, then we must organize our county commodity structures. Organize our structures county by county across this country. Horizontally, and organize our structure at every level, vertically, so that we can tie in a total organization of total communication and make the moves that we must make when we meet the adversaries from a point of strength. And there's no other way to do it, because that's what they understand, economic strength. That structure then becomes a very well-oiled system to carry out the strategy of getting into a bargaining position. And we've got to get into a bargaining position before you can bargain. And that is done in the country. That structure must be reinforced with new membership, with names on the membership agreement. Why? because the membership agreement of this organization is the very mortar that holds the bricks together, those bricks that make up our foundation of this organization. It's our fundamental plan on paper. And without it, you have no basic direction, no long-term commitment to collective bargaining, and you have no future leadership in this organization. But the membership agreement is not the only thing that's going to get the job done. You can't stop with signing new members. Because those new members are going to be needed to be guided, encouraged, and informed how they can move the commodities they own and control through this organization. You know, educational seminars and training meetings, I'm sure, are in the minds of all of us that somebody from somewhere should come to our county and have a seminar, and then we'll get the people together. And we'll get a trainer down here to make the seminar work. But folks, I want to tell you this. All of us, in agriculture, you and I, and I know it because you've gone through it, you've got an education valuable to this industry. You understand how to make nationwide collective bargaining work. You've gone through it. Help build it. Understand it. And don't keep that information locked up inside of you. We've got seminar people and trainee and trainers that at the national level, but we don't have that many, when you compare it to all of the people that can train and educate and encourage and guide the new young leadership in the country. They're you. 
take a small group of new young producers and sit down and explain and tell them about your experiences, how they can put their product together with their neighbors and build collective bargaining strength. Folks, we have an organization of tremendous wealth and value because it's made up of people. People at every level, leadership, that have gone through the years of experience of building this organization. There is no reason why each and every one of us can take that experience that we have and cause a tremendous groundswell of growth across this country this winter, if we only will. Depend upon yourself because you have the ability. And if you'll do that, all of ourselves together will cause it to happen. And tomorrow as you go through the various commodity meetings and the budget and finance meeting and the county officers meetings that you'll be going to, you'll be getting an insight and an understanding about where we were where we came from, where we're at today, and where we're going tomorrow. Why we have to give attention to all three elements within our organization, people, commodity, and finance. And why strategies are based on a combination of all of these elements. Why they cannot be separated. And very importantly, you will recognize the struggle that your organization has had for its very life in the recent months and years. And you will recognize our, your success in winning that struggle. And when you go back in the country, when you go back to your counties and to your farms, you are going to become the leaders in this battle for the life and death, life or death of agriculture as a free enterprise system. And I ask you this, prepare yourselves. Be ready to back your commitment in collective bargaining. Stand strong on your principles. Lead your fellow man to help build the bargaining strength that we're going to need. Speak your principles and your beliefs firmly because you and I don't have a thing that we need to apologize for in the 25 years that we've been building this industry, this organization. Every step we made had to be taken to get to the next step to where we are today. And you have it to take back with you. You can take great pride in the fact that you are the only organization that is alive and well today, prepared to take the offensive and deal with our adversaries head on. The National Farmers Organization is the vehicle. Our togetherness and team action is the throttle. And our successes will be the fuel in the weeks and months ahead. The destiny of agriculture hinges on the decisions that are going to be made here at this convention. God bless us.
is an address by Charles Frazier, Director of NFO Washington Office in Washington, D.C., on legislation. I won't spend time on the milk bill because it has been discussed and will be discussed more by Al Scott and your good people in the milk program sessions. Uh, it did take a lot of time back in Washington. It is a compromise. Parts of it we were proud of. Parts of it, as you know, we grew a little disgusted with and we grew quite a bit older before we got through with that 18 months fight. There are many stories and I'll be happy to discuss that a little more with you tomorrow in our session with state and district leaders on legislation and on political activities. We can go a little deeper in some of these things then if you wish to do so. Today, I'm only going to try to hit the highlights with you. You'll remember for two or three years, we were worrying about a bargaining bill coming up. Some California politicians especially were pushing pretty hard from some quarters out there. I think we've got a pretty good job done on it up to the present time. It has not been reintroduced or pushed in this Congress. So I would be very surprised to see it come out next year as a controversial item. I think we're past that hurdle again for quite a little period of time. We look forward to some things now in the coming 12 months. And I know that you follow the national events and the confrontations that we'll say make life rather miserable for the national leadership of our government scattered about all over the world. And they do have a bearing on what we are able to do for farmers in the Congress and in Washington. But I would risk boring you just for a moment to try to point out that I think there are three areas of conflict that are going to continue to confront us in our legislative efforts in Washington and for that matter in our work with the department personnel, they are going to continue to be, should we say, a set of political headaches as they go into another presidential election in 1984. One of the areas of conflict I refer to is the one that's generally developed in any discussion of export markets and further expansion of foreign trade. As you know, the, both the quantities and the dollar value of our exports have slipped in the last year or so. We do try to follow this with some interest, and only a few weeks ago, much to my surprise, after some letters had come to several of us in Washington, I got a call out of Brussels from one of the spokesmen of the EEC community Agricultural Ministerial Council. They were coming to Washington to meet with the Chamber of Commerce and so on, but he was telephoning because they wanted to have a little separate session with the people that represent farmers in Washington. I felt complimented and pleased, and I did telephone some of our friends, and I did set up the meeting, and about a half a dozen of us representing Farmers Union Grange the other organizations, wheat growers and so on, met with these men from the EEC. Those of you who have read and followed the foreign trade patterns are aware of the fact that they used the floating levies in Europe to buy our grain at one price while exacting the levies between our sales and their manufacturers and used that money to subsidize their farmers they developed this policy many years ago, unlike the United States where we generally have followed a cheap food policy and let the farmers be pushed off the land and sent into the city since World War II. In Europe, they've made the effort to hold their people back on the land. Now, the point of this little story, 
These men from several of those countries sitting with us to visit for a couple of hours tell us in plain, understandable language their reserve of funds to make the payments to their producers is overextended. They're running short of money. Great Britain has insisted that they are not going to come up with further funds for their part of the burden unless they have some changes in the EEC agricultural policies. And those changes are, so far have not been agreed upon at the head of state level in Europe. So it would appear that there will be, that there will have to be some change in the policies of the European countries that have been subsidizing exports in competition with our farm products going into the third world countries around the world. Now, I, I can't carry that one much farther for you, but I can tell you that it is alive. It is a real question right now, and if you want to follow it some through through our best sources, our best journal, I think we will see some change of policy that may be beneficial to us in our export markets abroad over the next couple of years. There's a second area of confrontation, and this one I can only describe to you, and I know you'll recognize it. I can't make any promises on the outcome. But it is real, it is live, it is what we must work with every day back in Washington. The President has just recently strongly reiterated his absolute commitment that he will not accept any new legislation increasing taxes. He's found this one to be a good, solid political position in his first election and through three years of politics. And what he's saying to everyone in Washington that listens at all is that he's going to stay with it. In contrast with that, there are responsible men in both parties in the Congress that are growing deeply concerned about our increasing commitment to defense costs and our continuation of budget deficits in the $200 billion range last year, this year, probably in the year before us. And at the rate commitments are being made on defense contract material and with the hot spots that are developing in South and Central America, in the Far East, and with the confrontations that we still face as a nation, it does not appear to some of us who've been around that town for quite a while that there's going to be any reversal or change in direction on the commitments for defense spending. And I'll highlight this one for you one way I'm confident that the senator who made the statement in the record in the Congress knew what he was doing and knew what he was talking about. He recently pointed out that with our current commitments on all types of defense contracting, both for our own forces and what we're committed to furnish to other countries abroad, and with the burden that we carry on the national debt in the form of payments and interest rates, with those two large items running at current levels, you could stop the rest of the federal government for 12 months and at our current level of tax income, you would still have a national federal deficit in the budget. 
My friends, I don't have the answer. I've been around long enough. I've, I learned a long time ago not to pretend to know all the answers to all the problems. But I can tell you that we're going to have to continue to take an interest as good responsible citizens and, and, and we all think that we fit in that category. We cannot continue to run a national government $200 billion in the red year after year accumulating more debts and still wonder where we're going to come out in this country. We all know there will have to be a change in direction of some sort in the management of that federal government. You just can't go on like this forever. There is one other area of conflict that I mentioned to you, and I hope I don't sound too discouraging. We've learned the hard way in working with the Congress and with this administration on farm bills in 1981, 1982, and now recently on the milk bill. It has become a fine art back in Washington on the part of Mr. Stockman over at OMB, some of the people around the White House, some of the people at Treasury, they'd like to save some money somewhere. They keep looking at us, and if they only knew how to run farm programs, maybe they would save some money with us. But the trouble is they're not using cross-compliance. They're not doing anything to restrict the flow of the money to the large corporate farmers and outside investors that are buying our farmland. And as a consequence, the cost of these farm programs have grown to inordinate levels. They are out of all hand, out of all control. And I say that objectively and as one who's worked in both Republican and Democratic administrations for a long time, no one has ever seen the money roll out of that Treasury as it has done this last year on the regular price support programs plus the PIC program. Now, you've got to keep this one in mind. Going into a presidential election year, you're going to hear a lot of new propositions. You're going to hear a lot of speeches. You're going to hear a lot of people holding forth new ideas on how to shape up a farm program. But the truth of the matter is, some very, very fast, hard-thinking people back there are going to continue to try to play off the commodity groups one against another when we got ready to write a 1985 farm bill. After working with farm legislation all these years, I've almost come to the viewpoint that even though we believe that bargaining is our main thrust, our main program, and that farm program is a prop to help us in some periods of time, it has almost become more of a burden than a help at the rate they're running them in this day and age. I encourage you to think seriously over the next 12 months as to what our position really will be in the spring of 1985 when it will be time to write another major farm bill. You watch closely. This milk legislation that was finally finished is timed to terminate at that time. Your grain program legislation, now written, will terminate then. The recent changes they've made in tobacco and peanuts and cotton and some other programs will terminate them. The sugar program arrangement has a time lock on it. The whole thing is coming to a head after the next national presidential election, and you're going to have one grand strategy in Washington on the part of some people to pit one producer group against another on what you can do in farm legislation in that Congress. That conflict 
will be with us for the next 18 months. I'm not proud to stand up here and tell you about it, but I'll guarantee you, you better look forward to it and do as well as you can to deal with it. Now to close on a little higher note, let me try it this way. Devon mentioned the National Farm Coalition in which we are active back in town. We do have some good friends in other organizations. I have a man from Farmers Union coming in here to work with me tomorrow in one of our panels with the state and district leader groups that I mentioned a moment ago. We have good friends in some other organizations and we are trying hard to work together and we're proud of what you're doing out here in some of the states where you've got stronger efforts going to tie together several organizations that can agree on some goals and strive for some of the same accomplishments. We're going to need more unity. We're going to need bargaining. And this organization today is probably in the strongest position to move forward to help protect prices and farm income of any time since I've known anything about the outfit when it was formed over 25 years ago. I'm happy to be with you.